Hi, Glennis. Hey, Aaron. What do you want to talk about today? How much I f- hate diets. <laughs> yeah, diets suck. <laughs> so what do you do instead of a diet? Intuitive eating. Health at every size. So how many times have you had to explain intuitive eating and health at every size to someone? Like 5,000 times. But and- that was just to my doctor. <laughs> Okay, so how many times have you explained it to someone and then they said, but diets are the only thing I know? That's like every time. Can we pursue health without thinking about weight? Yes, we can pursue health without thinking about weight. That's pretty revolutionary what you just said. But what if you just don't like yourself at the size that you're at? I think we need to understand why instead of just saying I need to change. So, what's the deal with body positivity? Oh man, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Flores. And I'm Glennis Oyston. And we are Dietitians, Dietitians Unplugged. Unplugged. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back for another episode of Dietitians Unplugged. How you doing, Glennis? I am doing great. What are we talking about today? Today, this is a really important episode, especially... Uh, coming up as we're recording this right before the new year and a really good episode for anyone who's just new to our podcast. We're going to talk about why, um, why you don't want to go on a diet and this new year or really ever, I guess. Right. Cause this is like the diet season. I've officially come to know January, the beginning of a year. Um, people are just like, okay, I got through the, the holiday season and it was a lot of eating involved. And now I'm going to start new. And their their first thoughts of sort of starting anew, which I think is natural to think about at this time of year. Like, yeah, it is sort of the end of a year for a lot of people. And, um, you know, starting new seems like, oh, this is a fresh start kind of thing. But the thing that people try to do is start a diet usually because it's usually sort of a- around health, right? People are like health or their size and it's just like oh i know the first thing the easiest thing i could do is start a diet yeah so it tis the season right tis the dieting season and uh and so so this episode is for all of those folks who are uh maybe teetering on the edge of going on a diet or contemplating going on a diet uh this one's going to be for you uh but before we get to that um any updates you want to give glennis like what's what's new what's going on with you um, let's see. Still seeing people in my private practice here in West LA. Um, that is awesome. And groups coming up. I am running our diabetes group, um, he- Health at Every Size, Care for Diabetes with Rebecca Scritchfield. That's going to start up in March. And we are um, collecting names for people who want to be alerted to when that is the registration is open. So if you want to send me an email at Glennis, G-L-E-N-Y-S, at dare to not diet.com or I'll put a link in the show notes to where you can also uh, sign up for updates on, on when that group is running. And yeah, it's it was a really great group that we ran last year and just providing non weight focused care for and non restrictive care for diabetes. And it was it's really great. And we're looking forward to running it again um, this March. Awesome. How about you? Um- you know, sort of the same private practice is going very well. And there's definitely open slots for people to, to work with me, both uh, in person and virtually. Um, the binge eating disorder program that's called Path to Peace it, at Center for Discovery is also doing very well. So if you're interested in, or if you're struggling with binge eating disorder and you need maybe some more support and you're looking for um, an outpatient program, uh, you can definitely email me and I can help you get in touch with those folks. Uh, and and I'm you know there's I'm just starting my new uh, men's body trust group that'll start January eighth. So there's still time to sign up for that. You'll be cutting it right under the under the wire, but there's plenty of space um, for you to to join. And then you know the other thing is. Uh, and do we want to give people maybe an update of what we're going to do with the podcast for the next year? Because you know, 2019, you know, it's going to sure. it's going to be the year of the yeah. podcast. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna really uh, be bringing it this yeah. year. So our our goal is you know to really sort of commit to some some regular uh, recordings and make sure that you're getting uh, to hear from us on a really regular basis. And you know, we want to give a huge shout out to our editor Toby because he's just a as as well as editing, he's he also is a mentor for us and helps 
sort of give us some great tips. So, so thank you to Toby Lyles for all of his support with that. And uh, it should be a great year podcast wise too. Yeah, hoping to bring you some fun content. And, you know, it's always fun when you hear back from people and they say things like, you know what, really just, I love all your episodes, but really like when you guys just, you know, shoot the shit. I don't think they say it as impolitely as I just did. (laughs) But (laughs) when you guys are just talking, I was like, yeah, that is really fun. And we have, you know, been focused a lot on guests in the past year, um, which is awesome because we learn so much from from those people. But uh, it is fun to just sit around and um, chit chat with you a little bit about stuff. Get ranty. We got chemistry, yo. Yeah, <laughs> we got mad chemistry. Mad. Even in different rooms, even in different rooms yeah. across the city. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so we're going to I think we're going to maybe go back to that and do a little bit more of us just ranting about stuff. Yeah. Which is like so fun to do. Totally. It's like, you know, like the name of the podcast, right? It's just sort of hanging out with a friend and and bantering back and forth and letting people in on the conversation. Yeah, it's sort of like a oh, fun fun fact about our name, Dietitians Unplugged. It's frequent that I um, sometimes forget to uh, plug something in. <laughs> with regards to the podcast. With regards to all the equipment we yes. have here. Yes. And you always say, have you plugged it in? Have you turned it on? And yeah. that's usually the you troubleshot for me. <laughs> it's usually the simplest answer. Yeah. So the, the a little background to our name. If you're coming in new to this podcast, this is a great time because one, the topic is going to be, you know, kind of tell you what we're all about. And also you get to hear <laughs> the origin of our name. There you go. It's the, the origin fake, story. The, the fake origin story yeah. of our name. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So let's dive in. Yeah, what I wanted to say was, first of all, there was an awesome article in Huffington Post about um, 12 reasons to ditch dieting this year. And you are a major star in this article. Uh, Thank you. Yes, they reached out (laughs) to me and asked if I could contribute some stuff uh, about why you shouldn't be on a diet. And uh, and I was very happy to. Side note, um, I have submitted countless blog ideas to Huffington Post. All of them have either not never been answered or rejected. So it's been one of those life goals to be in Huffington Post. Yeah. So uh, so this is like a big check off on the goals box. Yeah, well, that must have paid off, though, because somewhere they had your name floating around. They're like, oh, this guy is like emailing us all the time. <laughs> just go, just we better to him. He won't <laughs> stop emailing us. But, you know, that's how you get stuff done in media. Yeah, you just, little do they know, this is like, this is like releasing the Kraken. So <laughs> now that... You're going to double down on emails to Huffington Post. Exactly. You need to be a regular contributor. Yes, you do need (laughs) to be a regular contributor to Huffington Post. I agree. It's like the Jedi mind trick. If they just, if I keep saying it, they will believe it. Yes, (laughs) exactly. I am a contributor to Huffington Post. Yes, I am. (laughs) Exactly. So, so yeah, we're getting a lot of material from that article. Uh, There were some great themes in there. But, you know, like this, this time of year, you know, because it's the new year, I think it is common, like you were saying earlier, common for us to reflect on anything. Um, You know, what what are we doing well? What do we want to change? I mean, that's just sort of like a a natural process that comes about this time of year. And you're right. Most of our, many of us focus on, you know, changing the size of our body and eating differently over the course of 2019. So, you know, this is just the time of year where that really uh, really starts strong in a lot of people's minds. Yeah, and I think it seems like a an easy and obvious place to start, right? Because people are thinking, well, it's easy just to lose weight. And it must be because there are so many programs out there promoting it. Doctors are telling us to do it. You know, they're tossing that advice off like it's the easiest thing in the world. Oh, just lose weight. You know, so I think it seems like the obvious to, to start. I also think like with so many people starting, I think there is a community aspect to this. I think, you know, oh, I, my friend's going to do X diet and, and, and this friend's going to do this. So I might as well join them. You know, I might as well like do it with them. Maybe if I have some support, it'll work this time. Or, you know, this time it's going to be different because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, so, you know, I think there's this like sort of, if other people are jumping out off the ledge, I'm going to jump off with them. 
uh, and we'll do it together. It's like a misery loves company kind of situation, I think, too. It's like, well, if yeah. we just do it all together, I mean, there might even be a fun aspect to it for people, right? Like, oh, this is a challenge yeah. that we can, you know, do together. And yeah. I think we can't ignore, too, the the role of weight stigma in right. decision, right? Because we do live in a society that does not, um, is not accepting towards larger bodies or bodies that fall outside of a certain parameter of, um, you know, measurements, essentially. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't blame people for that, too. Like, who wants to be stigmatized, right? So. Right. And I think, I think that is right there is the underlying reason for why so many people want and are going to try to pursue a diet, you know, this time of year is because they, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out like, Hey, how can I, how can I be a better person? And unfortunately we equate being a better person to the yes. size of your body. And that's, that's really the flaw in this. I mean, I think it's, we all strive to be better people. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think the problem is when we equate being better with thinner, that's, that is, you know, inherently where the weight stigma and fat phobia shows up in our world. Right. We're attaching morality to body size and body shape. Like if I, if I just had a smaller waist, I'd be a better person. It's like, mm, that's a, it's a leap, but okay, let's, let's go with it and see, you know, how that works out. So we've both been on diets, right? Yes. Looking back, what sort of was behind your first diet? What was the reason behind your first diet? Uh, geez. Uh, you're asking me to go way back in the time machine there. Um, totally throwing you off course here. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I think my first diet was definitely focused on weight and it was not really my choice. It was sort of encouraged, um, by my family. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I went along with it. Listen, I wasn't, I could have easily dug my feet in and said no. Uh, but I went along with it because of that exact thing. Like you were just saying, like I, I wanted to just probably be, uh, thinner and more accepted. Uh, yeah. so I, I was probably, you know, in my, I was in my teens. Well, not probably. I was, I was in my teens. Yeah. So acceptance, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and who, who can blame somebody for wanting to be more accepted? Right. Right. That's, that's a human need. Exactly. That is a human need to, on some level, be accepted. And, you know, especially from your family, if that's going to sort of make them happy, it's like, okay, let's, so a lot of, a lot of people do that. A lot of people go on diets from pressure from their family. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, not to blame families because this is, they're all operating from some knowledge that is incorrect, but that it, it's, it's a case of everybody knows. Yeah putting that in quotes, right? Everybody knows that being overweight or obese is a problem. Those are two words I do not like using, but let's use the, just to use the lingo that they're sort of running with, mm -hmm. right? So it's like everybody knows being too big is, is bad for you kind of thing. So, and they haven't sort of, most people are not dialed into this new information of like, even if that were true, this is not the path to health. Right. And that was even 30 years ago, right? When I'm my experience. Right. So um, I don't know if any of this was sort of in our vernacular at that point. And, and also, I think, you know, again, I, I think that, like you said, it's like we, we could spend a lot of time blaming people for the influence of that. But it's, I mean, it's almost like you, you don't know any better, right? And it's just like, there's no right. other way. And it just shows how, how diet culture is so strong uh, and and pervasive, um, even like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, on and on and on, um, that it's really just sort of the only way we have thought around food and bodies and, and exercise is from a diet mentality. Yeah. And so with all these kind of valid reasons that people have for wanting to pursue weight loss, um, I'll call them valid because they're valid to those people, right? Yeah. Those are very personally valid. Whether they're whether they're true or not in the in the larger scheme of things is is debatable, but it's valid to that person. So with people having these very valid reasons for them to start diets, what's what's the problem, right? Like why why are we making such a big kerfuffle about 
don't don't diet. That's I feel like that's what we talk about all the time. Yeah. Don't diet. Well, I think we found the <laughs> why. I, th- I think we found our 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 word for 2019. Kerfuffle. <laughs> yes, we were looking for that earlier. What will be my? <laughs> I feel like my word of 2018 was objectification, and um, well, I'm going with 2019. Kerfuffle. I was like kerfuffle is yeah. like we're gonna bring that up a few times. Yeah, it's like yeah, <laughs> it's a good word. Um, yeah, no, but it's a great question. Like why? So. You know, what is inherently the problem, right? If if you are going to choose to go on a diet, like with these reasons that seem um, important and see and and are and and you know someone's going to do it, and really we need to break it down simply. That you know the number one thing that I would sort of say right now is that diets don't work, and and what I mean yeah. by work, right? Let's we need to define that is that the vast majority of people if we're defining working as you know losing weight and and changing the number on the scale uh most people long term are not going to succeed at that they are going to gain the weight back and it whether it's a, a one year period or or a three or five year period the vast majority of people will gain the weight back so inherently if we're going to define it just by that diets do not work. Right. And I th- people say, well, you know what? That worked for me. I lost weight. And it's like, well, get, like you said, we need to redefine what work means. So if we're saying it worked for a little while and then it just didn't stick for most people, this isn't a willpower issue, an individual willpower thing. This is this is a problem with the actual product. But that's why it's so seductive, right? Like most people can lose some weight in the short term. There are some bodies that become very resistant to it after multiple tries, but what we find is most people can lose weight. One to two years, it stays off. And then slowly, year three to year five, most people have regained some, all, or even more weight than they lost in the first place. Mm-hmm. So it it doesn't work, but that's also very sneaky because... Then people say, well, I, but I didn't work. I was the one who was broken. Right. I think that's the excellent point is that, you know, we go from this didn't work and then we start to blame something for, for why it didn't work. And I think our go-to solution or, or blame is ourselves, right? Our, is like us as a person. Um, and I think one important thing that I think you and I want everyone to understand is that actually the, the 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 reason you regain weight is actually not a failing of your body at all. It's actually the complete opposite. It's actually your body working exactly as it's designed to do. And, you know, there's nothing broken about it at all, uh, actually. It's actually, you know, completely functioning as it should, given the environment we're in. Right. Your body doesn't know that you want to lose some weight just to either whatever your reasoning is, like be healthier or look smaller. Your body thinks we're in a famine. Holy shit. Put the brakes on. Yeah. Um, slow down the metabolism. Let's. I'm going to figure out how to run with fewer you know, units of energy in me. And I'm going to save more energy as um, storage, um, fat storage. And it's exactly the opposite of what you want, you personally want to happen. But that is your body's life-saving mechanism. And, and so in fact, then looking at it that way, diets are kind of a threat to life in a way. Mm-hmm. If your body responds in such a freak out way. It's like, what is that saying about the act of dieting? It's, it's, it's a physical trauma to your body. Yeah. 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 And, and so, I mean, I think people need to sort of, you know, remember that, um, and come home to that because I think the really insidious part of diet culture is that when something quote unquote doesn't work or it's, it fails or you regain weight is that the messaging is, is pretty simple is you failed. Um, you didn't have enough willpower. Uh, you, you didn't follow the plan like you were supposed to any, it, it, all, every sort of excuse that comes up or every reason for why this thing didn't work is blaming the individual as some either lack of compliance, moral failing or being, or not being strong enough. Right. And that that would be a fine argument if this was happening to just a few people. But 
the, the, when we look at the science of the failure rates of diets, it's across the board. It's, it's not even a question of if people will regain weight. It's a question of when people will, will regain weight. That's what researchers are really looking at at this right. point. Right. And, and we know that most diet uh, studies don't go beyond two years anyway. And by that point, you see that people are already regaining weight but they consider it a success if like a few people have kept weight off. Right, or they're dropping so, out of the study, right? Because, <laughs> right. you know. Um, so I, diet, uh, diet shame runs deep. Yeah. Exactly. So I think we need to like help people understand that there's physical reasons why, you know, your body does this. It has to do with metabolism, it has to do with hormones, it has to do with hormones that regulate appetite and satisfaction. And those just naturally change when you start to restrict your intake. Um, and it's not a broken failing of your body. It's actually a compensation for for what your body sees as starvation. So that's the number one thing. Your body is not yeah. broken. It's working just as it should. Yeah. Weight, weight re regain is a sign, actually, that your body's processes are just fine. Yeah. Um, it's not doing what you want them to do, but it is it is essentially saving your life. Yeah. So. Yeah. Listen, I think one important thing that is that needs to sort of go along with this are, are we're sort of touching on the physical aspects of this. And I think the bridge is sort of how cravings work in our body and how, you know, when we decide to sort of restrict a certain food group uh, or even parts of that food group, usually right now it's sugar. That's, you know, sugar and carbs are the areas that most people mm -hmm. are, are demonizing right now um, is, you know, there's, there's both a physical and a psychological detriment to that, right? Mentally, as soon as we restrict something, we want it, right? That's just part of our, you know, if we say, don't have this, the next thing we want is that, um, you know, don't, you know, we have this thing at work, uh, it says like, do not open this, an alarm will go off. And as soon as that, that sign went up, I'm like, someone's going to open that darn thing. Uh, within like a week because like you're just putting a sign. It's like an invitation, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that's just sort of like our natural um, response. But I think the physical part is we restrict these nutrients that our body actually needs. And, you know, so there's like this physical part of saying like, you know, hey, I actually need some of that stuff. Like, give me some of that food. And then it feeds into that psychological part and it sets this recipe for like a restrict and binge cycle that so many people experience when they're either in the middle of or ending or coming off of a diet. Yeah, I mean, there's there are both biological and psychological cues to binge, I think, happening in the wake of restriction. So it's sort of like the psychological part. Well, the biological, let me start with that. The biological part is, is obvious. It's like your body needs a certain amount of energy. It craves being at homeostasis. So once you start to knock that off balance with less food than your body would normally want to run on, it starts, you know, hollering for more food and it starts, and then it shades into the psychological, right? Food starts to seem much more tasty than it is. It seems more appealing than it is. And then the psychological aspect on its own, even without, um, without calorie restriction, is I, I sort of set up the analogy of like, you know, if you've got a toddler and they're surrounded by toys, but you take one away and say, you can't play with this one. W what is the toy that that child wants? And it's always the one that they can't have. Or it's like they're surrounded by toys, but what do they want? They want um, mommy or daddy's phone. Yeah. Right. So it's sort of like, I, I want the, our toddler brain is like, I want the thing I can't have. So that's the cycle, psycho the psychological part component of of restriction too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, like these are just, I think it's really important. Our, everyone listening understands that this is not, this is not like a broken aspect of our body, right? Our body is not responding, uh, in a, in, in an incorrect way. This is, these are all really natural responses. And I'm going to keep sort of coming back to this notion because I think it, it's laying the foundation for, you know, what to do instead of a diet. Right? right. I mean, so we right. want to keep plugging this idea uh, back at, you know, reinforcing this idea that our bodies are not broken uh, because diet mentality tells us something completely different. Right. Exactly. It's like it, we start out with this idea that a fat body is an incorrect body and it needs solving. 
that is, I think that is the root of and the problem of diet culture. It starts out with your body is broken, right? Like I've had so many clients say, I was a slightly chubby child and they, you know, their parents were told by doctors, your, your child is going to get fat. And if you don't get a hold of this now, they're just going to be in big trouble someday. Right. And so they were put on, I have clients that were put on diets at five and, you know, 11 years old, like really young and, you know, it's such a terrible assault, physical assault to a, a child's body. You know, at that point, the body's like, Oh, I'm going to save your life. Yeah. We're going to we're going to keep running, so I'm really going to respond in that kind of classic way that we've talked about where metabolism slows, they they get better, at, you know, more efficient at using units of energy and storing more fat. And it just sets up a, a long cycle of, well, of course that child regained weight. That is a natural thing. So just starting out with this idea that a fat body is a broken body or an unhealthy body or an incorrect body is the big problem, yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it, it, you're, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think this is where, you know, even again, our parents um, or current parents are, you know, they're, they're, we see this proxy for health being body size, you know, and that, that those two are, are, must be connected because that's the only thing we've sort of been lear learned or been taught. I understand the intentions and the intentions are meant to be protective and good and, 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 you know, positive. They're doing harm long term. We know that we see that now. Uh, but it's, this is the product of, of really, being quite fat phobic as a, as a society and, and really f viewing larger bodies as, as, as significant problems and, and, and also seeing people in larger bodies as, uh, de facto unhealthy, uh, which is, which is the big problem. Yeah. Cause what would you say to those people who are saying, but a larger body is unhealthy? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's funny uh, as we were talking, um, I was reminded of a quote that I saw or that I read from um, Deb Brigard uh, around health at every size and this idea of quote unquote healthy weight. Um, and I'm going to read this quote and she's talking about principles of uh, health at every size. And she, she writes, the principles of health at every size approach take a person's day-to-day -day practices as the centerpiece of consideration rather than the number on the scale. Hayes assumes that the size a person is when they are doing the practices that support health is, by definition, their healthy weight. The number on the scale is an outcome that we cannot know ahead of time. We cannot choose the number. We can only choose our day-to-day -day practices and be honest about what is sustainable in our unique lives. So I like sort of sharing this quote with people because it highlights this idea that you know, your quote unquote healthy weight, one, we don't know what it's going to be. So it's, you know, if it's working with an adolescent, it's talking to the parents and saying, listen, we can't predict where this person who's either, uh, you know, a preteen or teen, um, the, where their weight is going to go in adulthood. But what we can do is create an environment where they are able to do sustainable self-care behaviors that support their long-term health without making the number on the scale important. Uh, and it's, not, it's right. not giving up. It's not just sort of letting them do whatever and, you know, letting them order whatever foods off Postmates and just, you know, sitting on the couch all day and whatever, right? It's, it's not about that, but it's about what sustainable practices can we sort of instill in our whole family that's not making the number on the scale, the goal, or actually the, the way to judge if we're successful or not. Right. And, and a big problem is that people do conflate weight and yeah. health, which is not now when we look at the, the studies and the evidence behind this, what we find is that people's behaviors have a much bigger impact on their health than their, their size or their, the number on the scale. So that's sort of, I think what's behind everything that Deb just said, like so eloquently, right? Like in the end, it comes down to what are the things you're doing on a daily basis to sort of help you to be as, you know, vital as you can be. Yeah. And again, I think the, the key, the key there is sustainable, you know, diet right. culture is all driven right. by shame. 
you know, again, we sort of highlighted this. If you you fail the diet, it's your fault. You're you didn't work hard enough. It's all shame driven. And what we're trying to think about is what's a more sustainable, more compassionate approach towards helping people do something that they feel like they can do for the for for their whole lives, not just for six weeks or thirty days or whatever. I mean, yes, you might quote unquote feel better after doing your thirty day whatever thing. But is it sustainable? Like, are you going to do it for the next 30 days? Are you going to do it for the next 90? And and if not, then choose something else. Yeah. And and I think an important, um, an important thing to know is when people do start a diet, there is, they do, sometimes they do report feeling good or better. It's important to sort of note that I think that there is a, what I've heard is that there's an endorphin release at the beginning of doing something that is potentially charged with hope and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the end to shame and the end to feeling bad. So that's why I, you know, and I even experienced it as a former dieter, like, Ooh, it's just so exciting to be in this new diet and you feel really good. But a lot of that is like a psychological, I feel good. Mm -hmm. If there are problems in eating, you know, if there's disordered eating present for you, it might even feel good to take a break from those disordered um, eating behaviors and, and try a new disordered eating behavior (laughs) restriction. Um, but even that, I think, can represent like a change where people feel like, ooh, this is, I feel good. So, but but those endorphins of something new and novel wear off at day 30, day 60, day 90, right? Like in the, in the long run, dieting and restriction is deeply unpleasant. And it, it sets up this whole bunch of stuff that you can't have or you can't do. And that it limits our experience as humans to some degree, right? Like people like, I can't, oh, my friends are going out for pizza tonight. I can't go with them. So that's really, that might be exciting on day three of your diet. That is a lot less exciting at six months um, or two years, right? So, So just be aware of the fact that it might feel good in the beginning, but that it might not be for the reasons you think it's it's feeling well, good. And, and I would also be curious to know how much of that feeling better is feeling less stigma. Absolutely, the the promise of feeling less stigma, right? right. right. Like ooh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself out of this out of this stigmatized position. That's probably very exciting to see an end to the crap that you're experiencing. Mm-hmm because of the societal crap that you're experiencing because of your body. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. You know, the other thing I just wanted to sort of biologically point out um, is, you know, again, I feel like, I feel like we're a couple of lawyers here arguing in front of, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the courts on why you should not diet. Right. And just uh, mm-hmm. another piece of mm-hmm. evidence for, for the, for the jury to note is um, just how starved our brains get once we restrict calories and, you know, oh, yeah. and that, that starved brain is, is, you know, not something to be taken lightly. I mean, because one, you know, we need our brains to, to do some processing and thinking and critical analysis. And if your brain is starved, your critical analysis skills are pretty poopy. Um, and, 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 and <laughs> that's a technical, it's a technical term. term. Pretty, um, and, 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 but you don't know it, you know, you're sort of like, Oh, th- I'm thinking really, but like, Once you start sort of nourishing your body a little bit better, you realize, or a little bit more, let's just say a little bit more, um, you, you actually realize I'm sort of in a fog, you know, this brain fog. Um, and our, our brain needs a significant amount of energy on a really regular basis to work efficiently and well. And, and when we restrict our, we do, we get just this fog over us and and we and our critical analysis and our processing skills diminish uh and and try to tell that to someone in the middle of that brain fog and they'll be like i'm totally fine yo like don't worry about it you know but it's like right you are not fine like this is not you know your (laughs) your brain is not okay right now Right. And, and we work with people that are at, at the most starved end of that, right? Like with eating sure. disorders and anorexia. We, it, and we see the, 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 the long-term end product of that is people come in dazed looking. They are, they are really barely functioning. And then you see them, you know, a few weeks later and all of a sudden they're fed and like they're a different person. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that's happening. Even if your dieting doesn't develop into an eating disorder, 
um, that is still, if you're restricting, you know, the energy that your brain needs, I think that there is um, to some degree of, you know, a decline in your brain function. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and it's harder to make good choices. Absolutely. And so I think it's also important to people that we are sort of clear, right? Not everyone who goes on a diet is going to develop an eating disorder. Uh, right. And, and, you know, eating disorders are complex. They're, they're uh, a mental health diagnosis. They are uh, multifactorial. There's genetic factors. There's trauma factors. There's um, so many different factors. Uh, so just because you diet doesn't mean you'll, you're going to develop an eating disorder. Right. And, you know, I would also say that eating, dis- or um, excuse me, going on a diet and restricting on some level is disordered eating. Right, just because right. you're restricted, it's the same behavior. It's right. it's in, in essence the same behavior that we see in people with eating disorders. So the behaviors, to some degree, are very similar. Absolutely, you're restricting the food. It's just with without the eating disorder, your life saving mechanisms can still kick in, and you your biological and psychological processes all override that in that. Um, those instincts override the behavior of restricting. Mm. Whereas with the eating disorder, I think those processes don't really kick in because like you said, it's, it's multifactorial. There's mental health um, considerations. There is, you know, trauma history, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the behaviors essentially are, are very similar. So diet culture sort of promotes eating disorder behaviors. Mm -hmm. And glamorizes it on some level too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I worked with somebody once who said, "Oh, I just never had the, I never had the um, willpower to develop an eating disorder." And I was just like, "That's the most insane thing somebody's ever said to me." I think. Yeah. So, which, which is like that to her is like, "Oh, the the people with eating disorders can manage to, you know, keep their weight off forever." It's like, yes, and also almost die. But that's the part that's not sort of, you know, um, mm-hmm. talked as much about. Yeah. So, but but it's definitely glamorized th- these behaviors. Okay, so the last thing I, I thought I would bring into this of, of building our case is, you know, the, the detriment of good versus bad thinking when it comes to food. Uh, and yes. and this sort of idea of, you know, this food is, is allowed, this food is not, uh, is extremely pervasive in our society. I think kids learn it at, at elementary school. You know, there's a lot of that that's taught at, you know, by teaching Nutrition at a very early age, and of and and in a way that is equating, um, you know, quote unquote healthier foods, uh, and bat and foods that you should not eat. Um, but I think we, you know, this is obviously diet culture's wheelhouse, um, and and it's very hard to challenge. And I think this is one of those, um, again, physical and emotional bridges in, in, and effects on uh, of diet culture. I think the, the emotional part is that uh, when we eat something good, we, we, we like sort of uh, think of ourselves as very lofty and, and, and good, you know, for doing something good. And when we eat something bad, we, we think of ourselves as, as really doing something horrible for ourselves. Um, the term junk food is just makes us think of like we're eating trash. Our body is, like a trash can if we're eating that. Uh, and it, it really pro- promotes, again, so much shame around our body. Uh, and, and you know, physically, you know, again, it just sort of leads to these cravings, right? I'm going to eat only good foods. I'm not going to eat any bad foods. Uh, and, and you know, we, our bodies don't really work like that. Our, our, you know, we, we, we need a variety of foods in our lives. Uh, and, and that's really what is most sustainable for us. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, the good, the good food, bad food thing is the thing I run up against with, with clients constantly. That's really where they suffer too, where it's like, you know, they have very strong emotional um, connections to some food or some foods are good and then other foods are very bad. And the irony is it's not actually helping them to not eat those foods because they will still binge on them. 
uh, in a very upsetting way for them. You know, it's like, oh, I, and then I end up binging on my bad food and then I feel sick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so the setting up of the good food, bad food, good body, bad body has actually not made anybody healthier. Right. It's just, it, it's just sort of upholding this idea, this, this hierarchy of worthy and unworthy bodies. I mean, the, the hierarchy of, of bodies, it's like set, it's just perpetuating oppression of people in larger bodies. Um, and then the, the hierarchy of food, good foods and bad foods, it's not actually helping people to eat better. Right. So it's not working on either of those levels. Right. I mean, we've been dieting for, you know, 10, 2000, yeah. 2000 <laughs> years. The, my research went back 2000 years when I was looking into it and it was like, wow, 2000 years. I was shocked by that. But yeah, we've been dieting for that long. Yeah. And so if it hasn't worked for that long, like why are we still doing this? Right. If we're still, if we've been dieting for 2000 years, I feel like we would have figured it out by now and there wouldn't be large people, right? Like that's the, that's the idea. Like if people could just do it right, there wouldn't be large people. It's like, well, that's not true. And we have 2000 years of history to look at to show us like, that's not true. So yeah. Yeah. We've been, we've been at it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So Glennis, anything you want to add to our case? caseload or witness uh, or evidence library? <laughs> so many, so many reasons to not diet, but it's not fun. It's deeply unpleasant. It creates a sense of shame and that there was something wrong with us. I mean, I think we touched on all that. So, I mean, those are the main things. Yeah. Upholds, upholds body oppression and it makes um, diet companies rich and it feeds into um, the ugly capitalist machine um, that diet industry is all a part of. Yeah. 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 So then, you know, just like our sort of intro, <laughs> uh, right? So then here's the evidence, right? You shouldn't go on a diet this year. We understand why you might. Uh, there's no judgment. But right. what's the alternative? So <laughs> I feel like a broken record, but there really are ways to address if you're ha if you have health concerns, Let's start with that because even if you knock down the vanity concern, people say, um, I don't, I shouldn't call it a vanity concern. If you knock down the, the, I want to look thinner mm -hmm. just so I fit in better concern, which is not, not easy to knock down, but people are willing to have that knocked down a little bit. They say, well, it's for my health. The reality is you can still, if you need to make changes to the way you eat, you can do that. And if you want to make changes in your self-care habits, like, oh, I need to add in more activity or movement, you can do that. Those things might not change your weight. Um, and in fact, most evidence points to just good self-care doesn't promote weight loss. Um, but, you know, you, you can do those things and chances are you might improve your health right? Yeah. We've seen the evidence, Dr. Linda Bacon's study. There are numerous studies around intuitive eating to show that they are, you know, they tend to have healthier habits. Um, eating, eating competence, the Ellen Satter model, another non-diet model, they, they tend to be healthier overall. Um, but basically, and, and looking at the studies that show that, um, you know, behaviors actually impact your health more than the number on the scale, you can do all of those things. We're not saying you can't try to eat uh, better, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use better, but but really what I'm trying to say is like have a better relationship to food, more relaxed relationship to food. You're able to think about nutrition without it becoming an obsession. You can do those things, yeah. um, which is what we help people yeah. do. And and I would just add to that, you know, that going back to this Deb Regard quote, right, is that, um, thinking of, you can do healthy things for your body. We want them to be sustainable. We want them to be from a place of compassion. We want them to, uh, to definitely help you feel better. You know, we just don't want it to, the focus of all of that to be the number on the scale. And the reason for that is that it does the da does damage in the long run. Exactly. Like we see people stair stepping their weight further up, right. which is 
typically the last thing that they want to happen for themselves. I have no personal problems with people at high weights. It's more like if you're, if the exact opposite thing is happening than what you want, then that is not, that is not going to be something that you probably want to do. Right. And, and, you know, I think it, it comes down to, um, you know, this is a lot of people hear this and they're going to be like, well, you're, you're asking me to like, just give up and resign myself to, you know, um, this sort of throw in the towel, fuck it mentality. Um, and it's, and it's, this is actually very different than that. This is actually, you know, what we are asking you to do is actually do something completely opposite. Um, and instead of mistrusting your body, uh, that it's done all these things wrong is actually to, to learn to respect and trust your body, treat it with some respect, try not to do it harm. Um, Understand that if you develop some of these intuitive eating skills, these health at every size principles, that your body has a lot of wisdom that it is trying to give you and trying to communicate to you. And what we need to do is be able to listen to that wisdom. And, you know, once you can do that, I think you will do a lot of things that feel really good and sustaining for you, like learning, you know, when um, how much food is, is really enough for you, right? How much food is satisfying? Um, how, you know, what, what does my body tell me about how frequent I should eat? Uh, what does my body tell me about what foods are the most energizing for me? The problem is we can't really get some of those answers until we really peel back the layers of diet culture, the good versus bad thinking, my body's broken, um, sort of creating some emotional equality for all foods and, and peeling back the layer of weight stigma in our society. So this is the antithesis of giving up. This is actually diving in very deep to uh, an embodiment that is sustainable for the long term and doing things that are really just that feel good for your body, but without having shame being the driving force. Yeah. And I think if you can look at what the driving force of your behavior is. So for instance, you know, I work with people who, who benefit from medical nutrition therapy, which is like things that you have to, you know, that you can do with your way of eating, your pattern of eating that might benefit, say something like, um, blood pressure, right? Like, so, so if your choice comes from a place of self care rather than a place of shame, I think that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so it's the motivation too. like, if somebody has to have less sodium because they have high blood pressure, um, that's coming from a place of, I need to care for myself. And, you know, this is the thing I need to do. It's still, I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's like a different motivation mm -hmm. versus, you know, I can't eat something because I feel shame about my body. Like the, I think the motivation for, for, Choices like that is very important to look at. Absolutely. So, you know, here's the thing. I think the take home, right? I think we've done a really um, good job of laying out why you shouldn't go on a diet and or, or if you're on one already, why you might want to do something differently. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, what is the alternative and what that alternative looks like. That alternative for many of us is quite drastic, a, quite a drastic shift to what we've learned in our lives. And that's why Glennis and I are here, right? That, and, and so many other dietitians and therapists um, across the country and across the world are diving into this work is because it, this is easier said than done. A lot of this work is really challenging and really butts up against a lot of things uh, that we sort of like held to be true, but also connects to our, our relationships with food, family, friends, etc. And we need someone along the way to help us. Uh, and this is why, you know, if you're going to see a dietitian, a nutritionist, a therapist, for any of these things around food, we really hope that you find someone that is informed with health at every size principles, informed with intuitive eating principles, uh, and, and really even uh, on top of all that, really informed around fat phobia and 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 weight stigma because that's a hugely important part of this whole equation and there are many of us out there it's not just Glennis and I there are many of us out there who can offer that support 
Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I see a lot of, you know, sometimes when I go on Facebook or something like that, I see in the different groups and people say, oh, I tried intuitive eating and it doesn't work for me. And I, I have a few thoughts, which is um, one, what does work mean? Are you trying to lose weight with it? Two, um, hey, maybe, you know, this is really hard to go from a diet mindset to an unrestrictive mindset. And maybe you just do need some help with it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if that is something that's available to you, I would say, um, and also think about how much money you've spent on diets, <laughs> probably spending it on, you know, working with a professional is actually going to be cheaper <laughs> in the long run. Yeah. It'll probably be the last bit of money you spend on it. It is, it is a good investment, um, to ultimately reach out for help. Right. Like we don't go around repairing our own cars. Most of us, we have to, you know, grudgingly pay that money to have somebody do it for us. And sometimes that's just the reality of when we're changing something big in our lives, it is helpful to reach out for help um, and get somebody to guide you through it a little bit. Absolutely. So, you know, we'll put links to like both our our websites, you know, um, we'll probably put some links to maybe find some other providers too um, that might be helpful because listen, there's, yeah. there's a lot of, you know, if, if, if our um, approach doesn't resonate with you. There's a lot of other very talented folks who who can do this work, uh, and you know we'll we'll, def- we'll post this article from the Huffington Post. And because you know, again, inform yourself with some of these resources. We want you to sort of, if this is your first time listening or first time sort of thinking about some of these things, is to let it sit for a while. You know, let it um, let it percolate. Uh, these are new ideas for a lot of us, and it takes time for us to really for them to settle and for us to internalize them. Yeah. And the question I would ask yourself is ultimately, because I'm not here to tell you to diet or not diet. You know, uh, I would love for diet culture to not exist because I see how many people it's hurting. But say somebody says, well, this is working for me. I'm like, hey, cool. You do you. Um, But I would ask people to at least explore the notion of, are you satisfied with things and what you're doing. Because I know for me, when I what finally kind of broke my diet for good after 16 years of it was I realized like I was deeply unhappy. Even though I was thinner, I was deeply unhappy with just worrying about food all the time. And it was it was literally a full-time job. <laughs> literally, because I became a dietitian and that was one of the reasons I was trying to become a dietitian. So just ask yourself, are you feeling satisfied with how you live your life with food, how you approach uh, movement, or or is it contributing to any sort of <laughs> deep, unsettled feeling? It's just it's just a good question to ask yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So don't diet. Don't diet. Don't <laughs> diet. Yeah. After I settle that, Man. don't diet. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> um, and you know, listen. I think this is a. Uh, we know that this message is sort of counter what you're hearing, especially this time of year. But again, we, it's, we think it's really important. And we think that, well, actually, we, we don't think, we know that once you really embrace a lot of this, um, your life changes in a really significant way for the better. And so we know the benefit that can come from this. So don't diet. You know, the other side is much prettier. Right. There is a fullness to life that you experience when you are able to get past body objectification, um, deprivation. There is really, I am just now sort of midlife discovering and experiencing what it means to have worth beyond what I look like. And that is like, it's kind of mind blowing um, to find so much satisfaction in, in not maintaining my appearance. I, it's just hard to describe, but I, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. So those, those things are sort of a a long-term possibility for people in life beyond diets. Absolutely. Well, Glennis, I think we did a good job on this one. I think the judge ruled in our favor. (laughs) Yes, exactly. With with no, we win. With no dissenting (laughs) opinions. Uh, We just ended diet culture. You're welcome. Um, (laughs) So, um, you know, like I said, we'll have a lot of uh, references to this stuff in the sh- in the show notes, uh, so feel free to check those out. Um, you can learn more about my work at my website, smashthewatriarchy.com, uh, and more about the groups I run there. And Glennis, where can we find you? 
Yep, I'm at daretonotdiet.com or actually also glennisoyston.com gets you there Hey-o. or Googling me or hitting the link in the show notes. There you go. Yeah. All right, so here's to um, kicking off a great 2019. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and stay tuned for future episodes. We're going to be doing uh, some interviews coming up, but also like Glenn said, a lot more one-to-one. So you definitely want to be subscribed because uh, there's going to be some great episodes coming your way very soon. Yes. Hit subscribe and also give us a review on iTunes. Um, sometimes we forget to say that, but giving us a review helps to push us up in some kind of magical iTunes stats and helps expose this podcast to more people. And we want to do that because we feel that, you know, strongly that we want to end diet culture so please give us a review on itunes yeah otherwise happy new year happy new year everybody thanks